fans. Hey. What's up? Friday hey. record day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think uh, this episode, since it's Friday and it's really late where David is, <laughs> brought to us by our there, Black Point There you whiskey. go. Oh, very nice. So I, think it's, I think it's a whiskey day, but really, in all reality, it's a Virginia distillery. Those guys make some of the best oh, stuff. Yeah. So those listening haven't checked it out, get it. Go get their courage and conviction. That stuff is is legit. Oh, yeah. sure. Bit of a distance for me unless they uh, unless they ship to the UK, but, you know, one can hope. We'll smuggle some over. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds or good we'll to give me. it to you when you're, when you're over here uh, shortly. And, uh, <laughs> there you go. And, uh, let you smuggle in. That's yes, really leave that on you. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. But uh, yeah, guys, a little, little bit of news in, in cyber this week. I figured it'd be co- co- covered. Uh, new NTLM relay attack, right? Anything that uh, is going after a domain controller kind of gets our uh, gets our attention. What is this one called? DFS Coerce? Yeah, DFS Coerce. It was um, Philip, uh, Philip Dragovic. Apologize to him if he ever watches this and I've said your name wrong. I'm yeah, killing name, names, as we all know. Last yeah. name's awesome. That is that is really impressive. Yeah. So he's built a really good little proof of concept. Um, it sounds condescending to call it little. It's actually a really good proof of concept. And he's talked about two different uh, ways of doing it. One is to call NTFS remove, and the other is NTFS uh, add. And I've actually got the POC. If anyone's really interested, we oh, can do. pull it up on screen now. Yeah. Well, Let's if we it. back up a little bit, like. <clears throat> Okay, right. bad guy lands in yeah. network. Yeah. What what comes yeah. what comes right. next? Okay. What does right. this so, exploit at a high level allow us to yeah. do? They'll so definitely get in, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> Once they're in. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. So you have I'm, to assume they get in. I'm uh my name's Fleming. I'm your your basic level <laughs> what was your uh, name? you know, employee I like it. Fleming. That's that's what I call all my uh, my victim <laughs> service. So right. I'm your basic level employee. I have no special privileges, but I am connected to your domain controller because you're the ones authorizing my level of access. What this exploit allows me to do is to return what's called the NTLM V2 hash for the domain controller. So not the hash of of my particular account, but an admin level privilege. And the reason that's really important is because with that level of access and the certification authority that's connected to the domain controller, I am then in a position to effectively uh, request the certificate from the server. So I can take that hash and either I can brute force it, which is really difficult, or I can um, take over the administrator certificate. And from there, you can then um, do what's known as creating a golden ticket. And that's an attack that is quite prevalent. Right. And what that means is I will give myself a cert that exists on that system with admin privileges that will never expire. And I can use it to do whatever I want. It's it's literally a you know <clears throat> that, that golden pass to everything on your network. And that's why these style attacks are so dangerous and so important to to identify. The so good this thing one about- allows remote code execution. So I'm, you know. On whatever patient zero box, yeah, I same magic as packets um, to this thing, and I get admin access initially, or do I have to then so jump you get, up? You get, well, no, you, you're, right you're straight into admin. admin, so you oh, got. Yeah, that's never. That's yeah, a bad there's one. A, yeah, there's this a tool a called. One. We're going to see this one used a lot. <laughs> yeah, so there's a tool called <laughs> NTLM Relay, and NTLM Relay allows you to um, take the returned hash, get the certificate for the administrator, and then from there you can actually add your own. Um, account to the certificate controller. So you can use that cert to do whatever you want. Because as far as the domain control is concerned and the certificate authority is concerned, you have a cert that's allowed to do these things. That's dangerous. It's kind of, kind of a new dangerous. riff on the, the, dangerous, the hash stuff. That yeah. we Still the, constantly, yeah. This is like, like John said, so this going to be exactly. the next thing, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. This is, this is like the Kerberos, you know, it, it gets yeah. you in a position exactly. to do the golden ticket, the Kerberos kind of token duplication right, yeah. attack, but the good yeah. one where you can have God mode for 10 years. Exactly. And and I mean, yeah. there's been a number of other implement uh, kind of similar things. So uh, Petty Patam um, was one of them. Shadow Coerce um, was another. You know, these these attacks are infrequent. Well, I say, say these exploits are infrequent, but they are damaging when they're, they're run. The good news about this one is it is actually possible to detect it, it being done. So it's always good. Um, the Windows event log will uh, identify the removal as, as 515. That's the event code. Uh, and there's 514 yeah. and 515 the event ID, yeah. are the event 
yeah, they're the event code IDs for, for the add and removal. So by monitoring those, you can identify when someone's trying to do these attacks. Um, so, I mean, if we're, if you want, I can, I can show you what we've, we've got Heck at yeah. the moment. I'm yeah. super curious. Okay. I haven't seen this. Let's, so. this. Well, let's take a I look. You've at been the, playing around with it since uh, the news dropped. So, uh, yeah. So let's take a look at the. Just for those that slow. don't know, David heads up our adversary pursuit group, which is really like our, our skunk works, threat and tell and rapid prototyping unit. So anytime something hot and fresh comes in we're always trying to run it understand it and then make sure you know we have defenses against it yeah and and this one was a this one was a really interesting one it's actually a really interesting proof of concept it was quite fun reading up the the background of of how it's done as well not just looking at the, the poc so here we have fleming the user <laughs> um who is just your bog standard everyday user so if we take a quick look at him um Oh man, go after my heart to jam everyone into users. <laughs> so <laughs> there, there's, there's going to be a one system admin that's chuckling right now. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, we've got a domain user on uh, our, our BPC local domain. Um, no special privileges. And over here, we've got our admin user, obviously, with the administrator rights and all the other things that you really want to lock down. You don't want to give that to to everyone. So um. Inside our events, we've obviously got the 514 and the uh, the 515. If we just take a quick look at these, um, we should see, in theory, these start to go up. So I'm going to change my share screen so that we're all on uh, on the fun Kali so window where all the magic's going to happen. So you're just logging into the Windows server, getting it. Yeah, that's just showcasing, showing, showcasing yeah, literally that. just showcasing. This is not me doing the attack. I'm just trying to show you what's running on that system. You got a normal trying, user, Fleming. Yeah, not normal a, user. No, no domain admin. So first and foremost, we're going to kick off our responder. Now, responder is a really interesting tool that comes with uh, Kali by default, and it allows me to basically pick up responses from the domain controller. Um, in this instance, I'm not going to do anything fancy. We're on 192.168. Uh, 64.20, which is the name of this attacker box. Okay. So it's not a compromised host. It's not any of these, but it is a a Kali box. And what you can see though is so you're like simulating, four, you know, a hacker in the environment, right? And like this, this hacker in the environment. Network. You know, yeah. yeah. But equally, if your domain controller is facing the internet, you don't need to be. So in, for example, here, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please don't. Uh, for example, Please here, don't. right, the, the responder IP and the external IP are the same just because I've said it, but I could set this IP to whatever I wanted it to be. So I could have an external IP that matches the the domain controllers and I'm still um, internal. So my, my IP would still be dot twenty, but my external facing IP would be completely different. We've got it up and running. Ignore the other stuff that's happening on that screen, but and the important We're bit is, is this... this sucker in. <laughs> oh, sorry. Is it is it really far out? Okay. My eyesight's still twenty twenty, but not twenty ninety. <laughs> <I, 2090>. Just, <laughs> just like, I mean, to put it into perspective, right? I'm using a a gigantic monitor because of oh, uh, sure. when when we'll you're zoom in the We'll zoom it yeah. in post production. Yeah, it's all good. Okay. Sounds it's good. good. Yeah. So DFS coerce is the is the mm -hmm. proof of concept. We've obviously got the user. We've got the domain. Um, the domain controller is. The 64100, that's the address that's there. This is the compromised instance that we're listening on. And, and again, this is the box we're targeting. So we run it. We obviously give our pseudo password for this device. And then we need the password for the Fleming user, um, which in this instance is this super complex, really secure password and is not um, just password with an at symbol. Um, once we run it, running, we get our RP, RPC. And you were just S. running the proof of concept. <clears throat> code that was just running the proof of concept. I'm only collecting the information. I'm not manipulating the information. This is really important. I'm not going to show people on this podcast how to then use this to, you know, gain the golden ticket. That seems really counterproductive. Um, anyone in the security industry kind of knows how to do it. We're not going to show it. We're just showcasing the, you know, the level of ease here. So I've run it. You can see that I'm sending the, the net uh, DFS remove route. This is what was sent. This is the root share, which is test that I've tried to remove. Um, and what we get back on the responder is the domain controller for BPC, which is the, the name of the, um, the forest, the domain, and then the salt and the hash. 
Um, I'll scroll down a little bit. Sorry. We'll just, uh, we'll just kill that. So it stops doing things. This is that primary information that either I could try and brute force if I was, you know, if I, if I thought I, it was a really insecure admin password, I could do that or pass it through to the NTLM relay and do all the bits and pieces that you would do as a follow on process. As I said, not going to do that because I don't really want to show people how to do it. But uh, if you're interested, you can go and find it. So you're not going to just package it all up, make it easy and put it on GitHub? <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm not a huge fan of doing that. I think I don't necessarily see a problem with it. If you could control the security researchers no, that are going well, to gain access to it, no, quite frankly, yeah. you can't guarantee who's going to gain access. Uh, and you I know, any, really... if you make it easy, yeah, people will use it for good and bad because right. it's easy i mean exactly that's the point so for for everyone else we're we're half making light of this but in all seriousness we we want to be educational but we don't want to enable uh, malicious use exactly exactly so um just to take a look mm -hmm. at the code uh what we're sending is this is the original proof of concept code so um you can see that the request that's being made is this uh net r uh, net r dfs remove std root the other way of doing it is exactly the same way net dr dfs add root so you can do add and remove which is what relates to the 514 and the 515 um, that we see on the box okay. so um if i so this is really targeting file server yes type of the dfs yeah. stuff so, so if we yeah. just go okay. back to our uh windows server box what we should see if everything's gone according to uh according to plan and this is when the curse of the live the demo live, kicks the in live demo yeah the live Live yeah. damage rumble. So let's go back to the. I get fifty percent chance of working. Fifty percent of the time, every time. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever the yeah, as, as what movie said. was that. Was I like that, your anchor man. I like your optimism. <laughs> I it was so we're at nine twenty three a.m. We're at nine twenty five now because you know um, the the attack did occur at nine twenty three. We can see that there was a request to move the standalone or cluster DFS namespace. The namespace, uh, the DFS server that was uh, attacking was the 6420, which was my Kali box. And the share that we were trying to remove was test. So that was the 515 event. 514 is when you try and add something. Um, and yeah, that's how you can track it. That's how you identify it. Um, you've got to be quick. But this is one of those ones where unless your EDR, your MDR is monitoring this environment and you've got the skills and the knowledge to identify when something uh, malicious is happening, you're probably going to struggle a little bit to, to see it. Now, Microsoft have yeah. released a guidance on how to disable the NTLM and, and basically make yourself secure, but it's not easy to follow. It's very complicated. And, and quite frankly, you'll probably stand a better chance in, in trusting your, your MDR or your SOC to, to protect you against this than going through the hassle of disabling the NTLM this, and potentially bringing down your domain This capability is right. going to unleash a new wave of ransomware and bad oh massive this is a loaded gun right here mm -hmm. yeah yeah hmm. now, now do you know if uh turning on smb signing is a mitigation for this uh i've not got that far into it i would imagine okay. that it is but to be honest my <clears throat> my domain controller has signing on by default so um probably Maybe not. not yeah, yeah. does off. it work with off, uh, my knowledge defender atp or what are they calling it now? Defender for empowering. Real time Managed protection. Defender, Managed def Defender for oh. empowering. Yeah. So <laughs> MD. I should probably I should probably clarify. I disabled the firewall and I disabled the the real time protection in order to make sure this proof of concept worked. I've not actually got through to the stages of of doing it, but I would okay. imagine, given that the prevalence of this and how it's targeting the Microsoft system, yeah. Yeah. they're looking into it and, and they, uh, it's, they're usually it pretty this, quick. Pretty good. Right. I mean, yeah. their their new Defender for endpoint. I mean. I know we don't like, you know, pimp products on this, you know, podcast, but I'm impressed. I'm yeah. impressed. Oh, yeah. It's doing good in my so testing. Far. In fact, it's I, think it's one of the, I think it's one of the best AV EDRs in the world right now. Yeah. I'd have Remember, to agree with you, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, and on, on, detec background, but. And on detection on this, too, it's probably going to come down more. Your automated solutions are probably mm -hmm. going to find the end goal. What What is the uh, threat actor actually launching? You probably won't get too much upfront information on where, how... You know, said we'll say Cobalt Strike because it's you know nine times that I think Cobalt Strike. Yeah. How it got launched on there, but you'll you know, so you're you're relying on that like end goal. But yeah, it, it is a possibility that you might miss the lead up. Uh, yeah, this, I mean, this the, is going to smoke a lot of orcs. Yeah, yeah, but this as one. you can see in the event viewer, there is a significant amount of information around which server kicked off the the attack, which was that yeah. that dot twenty. So I mean, 
one of the things to be aware of is if you see someone doing that testing, trying to remove something that doesn't exist in that environment or an IP is coming from outside your organization, right. be aware of it, monitor for it, look for the certificates that might have been added that look suspicious, you know, ones that live for an exceedingly long amount of time. You know, um, it's it's kind of a good segue. I read an article, um, you know, we know PowerShell's involved in almost lots of good and lots of bad. <laughs> the same quite a, time, right? quite a slip. <laughs> It's quite yeah. useful. <laughs> NSA released some guidance, National Security Agency, or, you know, our brothers and sisters over there. You know, we mm-hmm. love them dearly. Um, that kind of recommended, you know, org, you shouldn't just be trying to block it everywhere. And we all know it's really hard to block and stop using it anyway and even run a network at any sort of scale and size uh, because it can be used for so much detection. And I think they're totally right. Mm-hmm. I do also think there was some nuance massively missed there, which is most orgs and their domain administrators and IT infrastructure do not have time to be doing that granular le- or resources for that yeah. granular level of, yeah. of, you know, kind of leveraging PowerShell, hmm. you know, to catch bad guys. I, I actually didn't agree with the recommendation the flip side is i also don't know how you just like wholesale turn it off I know, right I mean, you got rmm tools that use it you got many tools that use it oh do you know how many products oh, yeah. we see freaking using powershell under the hood like, it's kind of scary yeah. we see creds all the time it's very but... very common i mean i think yeah i think it raises an interesting point and it 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 points out the the importance of monitoring for behaviors as opposed to monitoring for compromise yeah. and, and possibly yeah. just singling out solutions right it's not enough to say well we saw powershell launch is bad because as you said there's yeah. tons of tools that uh, legitimately use it but how many of those tools run hidden how many uh, of those yeah. tools are yeah. using base 64 encoded, encoded uh you know yeah. powershell the things that you know those tradecraft pieces that we always talk about and that we go on about because they're important are the key indicators of of that's it. What, this is know, how you catch pieces. stuff that's right. not getting picked the secret, up by right? the anti-malware exactly. platforms. I mean, this exactly. is it. I, exactly. You know, I, I think I just, you know, my sense is that guidance was created right. in a vacuum in a with a kind of in theory in a perfect world sort of yeah. setting. And I think it was rather detached from the reality of IT operations yeah. writ large at scale across the commercial world. And it yeah. sounds good on paper. This is going like from a guy who spent 12 years of his life at NSA yeah. and loves the place to death. So, you know, uh, but. Do you, do you ever I, wonder sometimes if there's not some some kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> ticks, know in a, ticks in a box where they've got to say it just so that if anyone ever turns around and says. PowerShell. All <laughs> users, local, everywhere. As long as you're our enemy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. I wasn't, I wasn't going to suggest that one. I was just saying, is it a tick in the box to say we've given we've given the advice, whether you follow it or not, is down to you. Yeah. So. I, you know, I, I just think, like, coming out of the government world, I think there's a lot of really brilliant, smart folks in there that are yeah. dedicated to their craft straight up. Yeah. I think. The challenge is they also don't get out into the right. commercial world enough. Mm. You know, see, I would love to see an exchange where, and I know they were, they did a little bit of this, but really going back and forth. You go in the commercial world, you come back to government service, commercial world, government, but whether it's a, a government sponsored, like almost, um, yeah. you know, almost like right. a, like a Govy internship where you get to go work. I, I really think that's critically important, specifically on cyber defense, because mm. they, it's really easy when you have domain expertise and knowledge, you're like, yeah, you could do X, Y, and Z. So like cake. Yeah. Okay. Well now bring like economics or running a business. How many IT professionals can you support oh, yeah. tooling, profit margins, all that. We yeah, get all that shit gets in the fucking way. Like, mm. let's be honest of becoming God mode on all this stuff. And I think there's just kind of a naive assumption that everyone can just implement this guidance and it's cake. Yeah. Um, I think that's it, right? There's there's that trade off between government and private. In private, we have obviously those things that we have to be aware of. You know, there's yeah. there's all those margins, um, and we have less restrictions on what we can actually do. Whereas in the government space, they have none of the margins, but they're restricted by, you know, the yeah. mission statement and what they're allowed to do <clears throat> legally. You know, there there there's a lot more sure. binding for for them. So it would sure. be nice to see them moving sure. between the two, so they can be like, well, this is a real world example, and this is what we can do, and. I you think know. it would be one of the best things, yeah. right? And I would like to see some of our, you know, uh, more red teamer types uh, do that. Mm. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, my mic. 
<laughs> it dropped out for a second. Thing. I can hear you now. Though. It was just like blinking at a rapid rate. So uh, <laughs> yeah. they must be listening. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Please yeah. don't mess with my yeah, mic. Listen, that's <laughs> what it is. Yeah. yeah. Your, your every, every time you say NSA, beautiful. it just bottoms out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, literally, my mic icon was coming on and off like someone was double clicking as fast as they could. It's Morse code saying, stop talking now. I know. You know, I read an article, guys. Uh, I know. It's like, nope, too much. Cross the line. Cross the line. Too much. Uh, <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, there's an interesting article I read about state-backed uh, hackers using ransomware as a decoy for cyber espionage mm. attacks. And, you know, mm. I read this article, and I would say, like, naively. I was like, because I read it as you know, the bad guys are going to come in and ransomware this corner of the network to like throw their scent off the trail so they could steal data in this other part of the network. And I was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. Who would do that? But I think it was really more, I'm going to go steal a bunch of data and smoke this joint on my way out so you can't figure out what my true intention was. Right, or what, you know, what was taken. Yeah. But they used the term ransomware as a decoy. So my question is, was there actually a ransom request or was it more of like a wiper style where it just wrecks it? I mean, I probably need to read it closer. I don't know, David or X, have you seen this technique? I mean, have we seen this technique? I don't remember at black point seeing it, but um, no, no, but I've had sneaking suspicions that allegedly some of these groups that are popular ransomware groups are kind of doing this under the covers. Well, I know we saw the Iranian group the yeah. other week and it was like, yeah. They pretty kind of seem state And they're taking the sport. ransom money, too, and they're just, like, pocketing it like a... Bonus. I think it's, like, both. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, an, MS, an MSP actually asked me this question earlier in the week. Uh, and and oh, really? what I said to them is, yeah, I mean, I've seen it once. In, in the last 10 years, I've seen it done where uh, ransomware was deployed post-theft of intellectual property, and everyone was focused on the ransomware component. It wasn't a wiper. Luckily, it was, you know... You could pay and get your, your stuff back. And there was backup servers to, to go for. But um, it was mainly so that they could steal intellectual property. Um, it has been done by threat actors that are not state-sponsored as well, where they've gone to steal from you know banking and accountancy firms and they leave ransomware on the way out. That right. seems to be more of the, the MO. But um, seeing state-sponsored groups do it, a, a part of me feels like it's beneath them. In all honesty, I, I feel right. like, you know, um, if you're going to go through all this effort of doing really cool stuff to get onto an endpoint, and, and they do a lot of really interesting ways of getting on there, right? As much as we're, we're here to stop them, you have to respect their tradecraft. They're doing some really yeah. cool stuff. And, and I mean, that's why know. I tell everyone the biggest difference between state-sponsored mm. and criminal group is the yeah. effort to gain oh, initial yeah. access. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But dropping yeah, ransomware on the way out. Look at the solar winds right. breach. I mean, yeah, quite a bit of effort went yep. into that one. That's a good thought, you know. Yeah, definitely. But it feels it feels to me like it's a little bit beneath them yeah. for just dropping yeah. ransomware on the way out to be like. Yeah. I also always wondered, but yeah. yeah, I was also wondered like how many groups, ransomware groups, like unknown ones that just kind of like are out there to doing this one off. You never even hear back, you hear about, and you know, could that be type of masquerade with it? This too, like you know, it's, no one's tracking every mm. single one of them. Uh, I know if I've, yeah, I've I mean, heard of people being like ransom, but I don't know by who. <laughs> I've heard of that before, and it's like it's kind of kind of yeah. an interesting case. Usually, they like leave some type of call. It's card. a weird ransom when, uh, when yeah. yeah, when like who do you contact? How do you? So make I've heard of those work? cases. Yeah. So maybe it's a it relation. Yeah. No, maybe no. You know, it's kind of an yeah. I mean, I wonder. I, I wonder if there is a little bit of you know, you you go onto the dark web, you buy some ransomware from someone that's on there, or you know, ransomware as a service. You leave it on a on an endpoint as a way of pointing the finger at someone else while you've made off with all the uh, intellectual property and the bits that you right. really cared about. God. And people Imagine going, if it was a botched deployment and you forgot to drop the note and there's like, oh, now I can't get paid. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine being that hacker being like, oh, I just wasted a bunch of effort. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oops. Yeah, that was, I, I just can't imagine Oops. building an op. I can totally imagine smoking the place on the way out. Like that mm -hmm. makes sense to me. Yeah. But I can't imagine right, smoking yeah. it with like, here's the ransom request. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it just feels like a tail that I wouldn't want to deal with. That That's being said, too, yeah. it's a pretty damn good cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's a pretty damn good cover. And what I would do is I would just use someone's 
you know, like a popular group's ransomware kit. I was about to say the same thing. I would just go grab the latest or whatever off the internet and be like, oh. Yeah, so. I'll come to you all of a sudden. Yeah. 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 Conti's like, man, we're I know, right? And Conti's like, thanks. (laughs) I think think this is good. Are we being teed up here? Yeah. (laughs) You know, just take it. I saw another article, um, which this doesn't get talked about enough, I don't think, which is kind of exploitation of, Things more like physical security systems, or in this case, it was a VoIP, a VoIP, uh, you know, basically a, a virtual VoIP switch uh, PBX platform. It was Mitel, and I read a cool article about this as a zero day. And you know, when you think about like a VoIP server, like there's a portion of that that absolutely has to be public facing, huh. right? Because it's kind of hard to make the connection to its other, you know, buddy servers out there. So. You know, is this, do you think we're going to see a little more of this? You know, there's, it's always the IT products that kind of are more like those are the telco, those are the telephone guys, or, you know, this is the physical security guys, I think are the sleepers for initial access. Uh, it's like a jumping off point. Like, I'm curious what you guys think about. Yeah. I mean, I, about this absolutely. One. I remember I did a demo years ago about exploiting a side server to get in. To a, a oh, that's network right. back, yeah. I remember that one. Stuff and it, that was like, and it was like, yeah. I mean, like this, you know, security's mom on those things. And even to this day, it's it's kind of a little bit better, but still, like, it took mm-hmm. me two days to figure out the signage server had some type of exploit in it, and uh, and how to get credentials out of it, and get into it, and turn it into it. And it was like an Android. Think about this: an Android signing. So I have Android's operating system now as a hacker to like do stuff and install whatever I want on on there and there's a lot of stuff for androids but i do think yeah it's a very interesting uh topic let me see that fish tank control oh yeah the fish you know fish tank is that a casino right yeah 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 from what yeah. i remember um but yeah it's it is an interesting way to kind of stay uh, in there you know and, and you know it's kind of initial pivot you know we've seen like when net scaler exploits were really popular a couple of years last year i can't remember time flies um but yeah people were getting into those load balancers and lingering for a while and, and doing stuff and you know it, it can be confusing to people that when that logs like why is my load balancer ip internal ip you know accessing these machines and you know you're logging all that stuff from a load balancer so sure yeah it's sure. an interesting gray area i think i think it raises an interesting point though like you've talked about this before john in that if you've got an internet facing product or solution and you're not paying to have it pen tested right. and properly pen tested right. what are you doing like it's some of them are expensive let's be honest but right. there's a number of great companies out there especially that offer it as as open source um kind of to teams and they pay them a bounty for finding it that you know will happily take on these challenges because they you know if if you're not getting them to do it there are bad guys out there doing it if you have something that's prevalent and internet facing, guaranteed someone's got a copy of the software and they're trying to go through it with a comb by looking for an X. Oh yeah, yeah. There's like, no question. I mean, yeah. anything internet facing. This is why I'm a big fan of zero trust network access. Yeah, I really would like to see our industry hammering this more. I mean, the reality is, if you have like, you know, we know our whole world is moving more oh, yeah. hybrid, right? Mm. You have some on-prem stuff. You're not going to get rid of laptops and things like and PCs. No. People have to interact with something. Uh, and then DC's moved to the cloud and things like that. But this whole DMZ concept, which, you know, I was a network engineer prior to this, this was, you know, beating your head is a great way to kind of secure a boundary. I think it's a shitty way to secure a boundary, not because it can't work. It's because most people screw it up because firewall right. rules are kind of complicated, especially. Things have gotten way more complex too since, you know, yeah, four or five years it's, ago. It's, there's it's more syncing complex. servers. Yeah, there's just a lot of new type of infrastructure that now needs to talk internally and you got this and you got that and you know single sign-on so everything got to talk back to your, your ad server for single sign you know <laughs> it's like getting, well that's it and months, everyone yeah. it, that's the issue yep. everyone when you're going to have to log in remotely you don't want to run a separate radius server you want to run right. ad yeah. and you point it to ad and that's why to be honest i think you know for our msp customer base the two things that made uh or three things that made insurers absolutely terrified of MSPs. I'm convinced it was that, well, I think it was an SL vulnerability that affected Pulse Secure, mm-hmm. FortiGates, and some of the other ones that allowed remote act. It was a remote code execution technique, so an exploit. You pop a, a VPN firewall, and now you get clear text password to anyone connected. Well, it's 
think about COVID for a second. Everyone connect, you know, you had your normal users, but the domain, the, the domain admins were also VPNing in. So you basically entered the network as domain admin, and then all the initial indicators before you get smashed will not get picked up by any AV or EDR because it's all just live off right. the land IT sort of techniques and tools. And so I feel you don't want any services listening on the boundary of a traditional perimeter anymore. That's tied to your core Windows domain, in my opinion. That's why I love zero trust network access because you have something on the inside, phones home to the cloud, and, and the remote access gets brokered in the cloud. I think yep. that this is a, you know, obviously those companies probably love what we're saying, but I really do believe this is a, would really be very effective mm -hmm. and needs to be increased. You know, that plus, I want to see a hardware token with the RMM solutions. Just yeah. Okay. So not just I mean, authenticator on your mobile and things like that. You want. Yeah, or you got to plug some. You know, if you want to auth mm. authorize a script to go out, a new script, right, yeah. to go get right. executed in the endpoints, you got to have something physical, right? Yeah. And I think that would mm. really, really, because we all know with MFA, the techniques are getting better to spoof an MFA login and just replay it, right? Yeah. And so, you know, MFA is good. It really reduces, but it's by no by no means a silver bullet for mm -hmm. for preventing uh, malicious login. So you really need that plus some other physical component that will prevent a new script from being pushed down. I mean, I, I think that would be that would be unbelievably effective against these RMM attacks. No, no, oh, definitely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. In interesting stuff you know it's always it's always evolving but once right. again it's still really the same you know i saw another article it was uh multiple backdoored python libraries caught stealing aws secrets and keys have you guys oh, read been, this one yeah that's been big well, well, i'll yeah. say that between this year and probably starting into last year it's been a sharp increase right. like people researchers too and also hackers really kind of mucking with like npm libraries and python libraries because you know when you, when you go to download new code and you have to set up all the packages you know it's hard to get all these packages all cracked and down but you can't do them one off so they made this you know process where it just automates downloading stuff you, know, you can use npm right. you can use yarn uh, right but you just run the command and it just does you're like cool and it's just downloading stuff from the it's just downloading packages from the internet you know and you're like oh wait wait, wait. you know hold on now you know uh and some of these things you know they have ways you could do scripts pre post install and uh people are hijacking they're either hijacking popular libraries or making libraries that are like typoed out a little bit. So right. when someone's typing it, they're like, oh, that must be the right one. You know, and then it's running commands and like grabbing AWS you know, creds and pinging back. And um, that's, really, it's been a, that's really interesting. It's been a yeah, sharp yeah, increase in, in tasks like that. And that's, that's where some I mean, of the supply chain stuff comes from because that's you're getting directly. Where's land. the compute going? Yeah. I mean, the, the tension, I mean, we're going to. You know, most of the world's still focused on endpoint, endpoint, endpoint. And that is still where the game is at for ransom events and things like that. But mm -hmm. let's be honest, like the API mm -hmm. hacking, stealing AWS secrets, be able to masquerading in the cloud. It's the same techniques. They're just slightly yeah. modified for cloud environments to masquerade. And I saw, you know, one of the security researchers, this is an article uh, I read on the Hacker News. I love yeah, that site, by the way. Yeah, but it was like multiple backdoor Python libraries caught stealing AWS secrets and yep. keys. Right. One of the the security researchers was this guy Ak Sharma. I don't know him, uh, but he's he's from Sonatype. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And I don't know if you guys know that Sonatype's another a local Baltimore security company. I know Silicon Valley gets all the press. <laughs> I think the DC Baltimore oh, yeah. area is the true, and Israel, the true hub of some of the most innovative cybersecurity technologies. And Sonotype is run by an absolute pro vet in this game, yep. Wayne Jackson, uh, as your CEO. He, he was Riverbed and a bunch of other, <laughs> other successful, um, I think he was even with, um, oh, they sold to Cisco. They were local X, we know them. Um, Sourcefire. Oh, uh, Sourcefire. Yeah. So I'm not surprised yeah, Sonotype's involved in that. You know, They're doing some really, really, really good work in my opinion. And I think that's another area that in our MSP space needs a lot more talk and attention, which is on secure coding practices. Mm -hmm. um, IT yep. tools are yep. God kind mode when they get co-opted, co-opted, yep. right? They really are. And in 
just like people are stealing AWS secrets, I mean, you're going to watch more and more security research going on to cloud hosted IT management solutions. And I really think we need to adopt, you know, I'm never the guy, you know, I hate, I freaking hate most of the compliance frameworks. I think they're garbage and they don't, I, we did this for a living as like bad guys. And I read a compliance framework and I'm like, this is clearly written by a guy that's never done it before. And it was all post breach. Um, I wonder, I wonder if anyone ever said when they caught someone, thank God I'm compliant. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I know all the hackers are like, oh shit, this guy is sock two. Type two. Oh no, he uh, sucked too. I'm, I'm, out not, I'm out of here. I'm not, not going to touch this shit. There's no way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one cares. It, it's literally, did you patch? <laughs> did you patch this vulnerability in your firewall? Did you have something in your DMZ listening? Did you patch it in time before I smashed you? Like the compliance stuff is good because it just kind of raises organizational maturity. Right. I would say. Can get people. Yeah. Like but I would. That. That aren't mature enough in security practices it's, can give them a little bit of a yeah, leg up. I would Makes really the right like questions. to see every compliance framework, with the exception of CIS, shot in the head. I know that's provocative, and I know lots of people make money pushing compliance frameworks and consulting on them. But CIS is written with actual details. Like you need to turn off yeah. the setting because this setting is going to f you at some don't, point. Don't don't they say they're not a framework though? Yeah, I know they. Yeah, I, but so I don't know another that's, word. Well, that, no, I think that's how they're getting around it. Isn't well, Benchmark yeah. is it benchmark? Yeah. Or something? Yeah. That's right. So you can take every frame. Hey, we had Phyllis and, and on recently, and like yeah. to be clear, yeah. we are not comped and have nope. any financial relationship with CIS. We just respect nope. the hell out of it. Oh yeah, you know, I like think Phyllis knows that stuff. She does. She does. Yeah, and it's common sense advice, and it's what yeah. the world, the the cyber and IT world needs to hear. Is like someone has to do. Like I tell everyone. Details are the only thing that matters in cybersecurity because that's what the bad guys take advantage of. And someone needs to be neck deep in the details and putting out actionable recommendations you can configure to reduce your attack surface. Mm -hmm. And I think CIS does that mm -hmm. better than anybody. And I think the insur insurers would be wise to adopt CIS as the, the framework, benchmarks, whatever the right term is of choice because it, it will work. It will absolutely mm -hmm. work. And this is us as a security company saying this, you know, that's almost in a perverse way, disadvantageous to us, but we want to see this industry right. move forward and, and yeah. progress. You know, what else have you guys been seeing? Anything else, you know, notable um, um, in the news this week? I know we covered the. Sorry, I'm, I'm still caught up on the, the Python stuff. I think that's really, that's, that's got me thinking now. I mean, how long before we see Docker containers with, with different, oh, God, with different ideas. it's effective. It's effective. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've always thought that one's the one who's back to mind things like RM and take over. It's, Docker yeah, it's, it's, URL, well, it's, it's effectively URL squatting, right? It's all the combo yeah. squatting and typo squatting, and now they're just applying it to, to Python. I think Python's scary only because every single Linux server you ever install has Python on by default. Yeah, it works. Yeah. I don't Speaking I mean, of your guys, Mac comes with Python. I thought this was like yeah. the whiskey episode, but I think I'm the only guy with it. So uh, I'm just going to roll with it. Just roll with yeah. it. We'll just keep it going. Just roll. I, uh, I don't have that cool. I don't have the cool uh, black point logo. To win. I know. No, no. Yeah. There should be some in the office. I think there is. Some. I don't know where you're at right now. But, uh, <laughs> I'm in the office. Yeah, this yeah. It's where X just kind of slides down his chair. Yeah, yeah. Out the door. I'm gonna screenshot myself and put it up real quick and come back. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what? Uh, back, back to your question. Um, password spraying. I know uh, it's. It uh, seems like something that lots everyone of data. should know about, and we always see it, but wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's one of those things that was eye-opening so once we kind of released our, one of our new products. The, oh, my goodness. Yep. Or yeah. cloud response. Cloud response. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. People are smash yes. constantly. Like, so the... <laughs> uh, yeah. There, you know, when we dropped this product, which is really so we could have active response yeah. capabilities yeah. in the three yeah. Listen, everyone's like, most people are going to this hybrid model, right? Yep. And we have to be able to respond on the endpoint real time and in the cloud real time. This is where the world is going. And so we released it. I was shocked at the volume of misuse, like or not misuse, you know, malicious activity in, in login attempts mm -hmm. that is not being picked up by any other product or tool, yeah. even Microsoft themselves. It blew my mind at the volume. And specifically, there are certain servers who are like the main culprits. It's kind of like yeah. in the, in the, I would say the spam 
you know, kind of the spam mm-hmm. game where there's these spam hubs, there's these password spray attack hubs. Like David, like what are you seeing? I know, you know, you're kind of like the, oh, the eyes and um, ears for us on this. So uh, I think the biggest one at the moment, there's a, there's a server in Australia that is is really going at it, really going at it yeah. hard. Um, and Will, the the uh, VP of, of the Threat Operations Center of the SOC, um, he actually linked an article recently that was talking about the top five highest hitting IPs. And you know what? This this one that we're seeing that's really responsible for password spraying was the top of our list as well. I think what would be really? interesting going forward is uh, and something that I'm, I'm interested in looking at to do myself is whether or not I can publish a list internally, maybe externally, of the highest hitting you know, IPs that we're seeing for password yeah. spraying that we can help educate MSPs to say, yeah. look, and the even if you're not using been... us and you see these, these are bad. Um, Where did you say that IP was? Australia. Australia. How mad Definitely is that? Not, like, not somewhere you ever think about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a guess. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that, that yeah, I mean, even we're being targeted. Let's be honest. As an organization, um, we're seeing people yeah. trying to uh, oh yeah th- that are trying to brute force um, some of the 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 staff here. Um, we've got a couple, Always. you know, ones that we're we're persistently tracking, but you know, we're we're shutting them down. I think this is the difficult thing for me and from a research position is I would love to get the full picture, but realistically we're doing our job well and we're stopping these attacks from getting any further, which stops me attributing. It stops me finding out all the extra stuff that they want to do after they gain a foothold. So uh, maybe I'll just set up a server that they can can compromise and do stuff on. Set up a 365 environment and sign up for a bunch of lists somewhere. Go buy some third market steam keys or something. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) That'll That'll get Get you act quick. <laughs> but uh Jason, one of our one of our analysts in the SOC, he um he actually put me onto a site I didn't know about, but you can check whether or not you've been pwned. I'm gonna do the finger right. quotes for pwnage, right? Um and and yeah, you can you can go on there and it's actually an interesting one where we're seeing the servers attacking people and we're seeing who they're attacking. Um taking those those addresses and just verifying them, we can see that their data's been shared and where it's been shared as well. So um Oh wow! You know, if, yeah, um, but yeah, password spraying is a big one. Uh, email impersonation, I think, is is another great one to follow. But that's a bit more tricky without access to the emails themselves. But brute forcing, right. I'm I'm very surprised by how yeah. prevalent that is. And there's not a great know, guidance on it either. Like, don't you, Microsoft yeah. doesn't tell you any of this. To be honest, your users are just no. like, why am I getting locked out? <laughs> yeah, and you're yeah. like, oh, no, oh, you typed your password in wrong. Just come back in ten minutes. Yeah, that's it. You know, yeah, and that's, that's the end it. of the conversation, right? <laughs> The Chris Rock thing. I don't know that shit. Keeping it real, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, but it's crazy because you know we always talk about phishing. Everyone everywhere is like, oh, they must have got on by a phishing email, and it was probably an email that did it. Well, actually, you know, we're seeing password spraying is pretty prevalent. It's it's and it works. We've detected and a lot it more than we thought. Bunch of times we've rolled out. Yeah. Well, that or yeah. just trying to trick a user into like confirming something mm-hmm. they didn't mm-hmm. do which most people are like okay oh, yeah. you know they close right. their eyes and click yeah like you know with a you know an enterprise app or something like that might yeah. right. or an mfa that's prompt another area that's just right yeah, yeah an mfa prompt you know that's right, the thing, right? For if abuse. it if it pops up and looks legitimate chances are yeah. someone's gonna click it i'm a firm believer you can trick any freaking human in the world once oh yeah, yeah. once if you if you plan it you can get them you can get them I mean, yeah. we're all susceptible. Do you to know how? Ones. Somehow, I had, I had my World of Warcraft account taken over. Once yeah. now. I'll admit, I'll admit, I don't know how. Yeah. I was also like twenty. But <laughs> I was like, how? And then my wife came at me. She's like, oh, hacker got hacked. Was, oh. You know, it's funny. My six-year-old gets on, uh, uh, on. Oh, what the shit is the game? I, of course, there's a brain fart. What is the name? Fortnite. Fortnite. Oh. Every Die. time he gets I shot, girls love that one. He'll exclaim before he smashes remote. He just hates losing. He's like, before he smashes <laughs> with his little six year old voice. Hackers. Hackers. Yeah. Hackers. Oh, yeah. That's Definitely a hack. hackers. Yeah, so, no one could aim bots. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aim bot hackers. I, uh, it that's, came out I of nowhere. Like, that's I, great. You know, I didn't teach him this. <laughs> that's great. Six years old. Yeah. Yelling at the hackers. Fortnite. You know, I, I love playing video games. I'm an absolute gamer at heart, and I tried Fortnite, and it was that moment that I realized, you know what? I'm too much of an old man for this game. I had to, I had yeah. to admit it. I had oh, to accept yeah. it. I was like, nope, I'm out. 
You know what I hated about Fortnite? <laughs> Everything. I hated well. I hated <laughs> the the mining part. Oh, it, like, yeah. Yeah. it seems so redundant. Like why? <laughs> like you just stay yeah, like. Uh, yeah, right. Like just slashing down at the same house every day. Yeah, that, that time. drove me crazy. And uh, and my kid was outside joking and he was smashing a plant. <laughs> and he was trying to yeah. gather resources. Yeah, that's what he said. I'm gathering resources. Fortnite. Yeah, yeah. I'm, like, Fortnite. I'm gonna beat you up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Five seconds Fortnite. to stop that. That's amazing. You know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's outside smashing. He plants. was. He was. I forget That's what so these fun. plants are called. They got like these blue flowers on them. But yeah, he's smashing so the shit out of it. <laughs> so fun, and uh, emulating Something I see Fortnite. myself doing uh, as a six-year-old. Yeah. I'm like, like I'm G, you're going to get something for real. Here Gather shortly. resources. <laughs> yeah. That's oh, funny. man. That's funny. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I agree. Everyone could be tricked once, you know. It's, oh, yeah. I mean, there's, I, I, again, I'm going I'm to call it going nerd mode, right? There's a lot of um, psychology research papers and things um, around levels of authority. If if, yeah. if you walk into a build, I mean, it's that's people tradecraft 101, right? If you, sure if you sound confident, if you say what you're believing, people are going to believe you. So if, you know, you pick up a phone and say, look, uh, you know, we're down in security. We've seen you accessing this. We just need you to approve the prompt on your screen. You have to do it. And you, you know, otherwise we're going to have to escort you out of the building. Someone's going to click it. Guarantee someone's going to click it. That is a very salient point. This is using levels of authority and kind of perceived power. You know, when you're doing disinformation or, you know, IO or whatever, it's incredibly important and successful. And it works really, really well. I mean, listen, we, we can't be naive and think our world doesn't have like levels of power. I mean, through society, we absolutely do. And people are conditioned to this. And, you know, I always, I always say like when you do an IO or fishing or spear fishing, someone specifically, this is just a new delivery mechanism for the oldest game in the world, which is the con man game. Right. And oh, yeah. those that are creative that understand and have like high social EQ right. are the ones that are some of the best mm -hmm you know, manipulators and best hackers, because it always doesn't have to be an exploit. In fact, the reality is you can get so much done with exploits yeah. by living off the land yeah. and that hides in plain sight. It's kind of like the, you know, I would say in like human operations, there's like, are you in like an official government official undercover or are you a businessman undercover, which would be non-official. Like the non-official stuff works better. Mm. It just does. But the risk of getting caught are much higher. Mm. Uh, and I and I think in the in the cyber world, there's a lot of corollary examples of of that right. model works and it works all the time. Yeah. Uh, and that's the biggest challenge, because, you know, when you get so focused on the malicious tool set, the code execution technique, which is the sexy, nerdy stuff, yeah. you forget all the stuff you can accomplish living off the land. And I think what we're watching like real time is the techniques as AVs get better at the spooky stuff and EDRs on, on you know, the, the process hollowing and memory injection, all that mm -hmm. stuff. They get good at catching that. Beggars like, yeah, well, you still got to administer your network. Yep. You still need to use PowerShell. You still need, still need an RMM. Yeah. If I can just become you, I win. This is why I think it's really important yeah. for, you know, for IT professionals and MSPs to <clears throat> not put too much on LinkedIn not put too much in job advertisements on all the shit they're running in their environment and what skills they're looking for. Because if, you know, most attacks we know are not targeted where it's like I've set out today and this is the company I'm going to hit. It's mostly like, you know, bots scanning or, you know, some automated process scanning. They find vulnerabilities and they hop in. But for those that do big game hunt, right. and this is more important for a large enterprise, I think, uh, I think they got to be really wise on what they allow people to put on their LinkedIn mm -hmm. profile and what they put in job descriptions, because oh. this is a gold mine. When you know what you're walking into is an ad a sophisticated adversary, it's a massive oh, leg up, okay. massive leg up. Right. But even even then, it's it's not just LinkedIn, right? It's it's your Facebook profiles that are not locked down. It's your Instagram, it's TikTok, it's all those other mm -hmm. ones, right? I mean, how many people? have especially straight out of college they buy their, their uh -huh. they get their first job they buy a really fancy car how many people right. post that picture on online so well i've got your license plate i just have to go to the dmv and i pay five dollars <laughs> and i get or the address that that car is registered to. Car. Yeah. yeah 
Like, yeah. well, yeah, you put, yeah, that's what you're selling your car. And so, well, now I've got your address and I know yeah, exactly yeah. where you live. And I know that, you know, because of your LinkedIn, that you're an IT administrator who probably has domain right. credentials. Right. And so you are now the primary focus. Oh, you've given me your email so I can message you about your car. Congratulations. Like this is, yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's, um, it's yeah. worrying. Like, but I think, you know, from anyone that's come from a government environment, they talk about this stuff all the time. And so you do get a little yeah. bit paranoid you do think about it and it is a primary concern and, and you don't grow out of it people in private industry who've never done that it, it's not thought about it's not talked about it's not something you consider it's yeah. um it should be it really should be you know i've been out of the community for years but it took me years to even come out and get online right and talk and, and show my face it, it took a while it was just really natural or really unnatural to do it mm. you know for me um but you know the reality is i'm not i'm not in the game i don't have anything useful or actionable anymore um you know so now main goal is to use all the the skills and and knowledge for good um you know on the defensive side and i think Absolutely. it's uh you know i i really when i put myself in the shoes of the typical end customer managed IT service provider. This is SMB America, Canada, you know, the rest of the world sort of thing. Most of these companies cannot mm -hmm. survive a ransomware attack. And, and most of these companies are lifestyle businesses where this is mm -hmm. literally their livelihood. Yeah. You know, and, and, and this is one of the things that pisses me off when I see a lot of the kind of fear, uncertainty, doubt, fear mongering type marketing, you know, ploys by security companies. And they're not focused on like details that actually matter. Uh, because think about the end customer. What are they facing? Right. They just, they need, listen, let's be honest. Yeah, IT yeah. and IT security, we're the help. And I think we need to understand that. Like we're the help to enable the business and what they're doing you know, to make money and provide for, you know, their employees and their families and, and everything else. And, but we need to be elite level help. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? We need to be at the top of our game because, you know, people's yeah. livelihoods depend on this mm. shit. Yeah. And I think, it, I think it's really important. That's how I know we look at it, but I, I think if you go in with that mindset and it's not to be overly serious, but this is a serious freaking topic. And details do matter in this game, and your service provider should be really in tune with the mm -hmm. details. So, you know, if nothing else, I hope discussing this stuff, you know, demonstrates to folks how much we care uh, and how much you need to care, you know, if, if it's not us, if it's someone else. To be honest, I mean, I think that's something we emphasize on here. We do it on the, the Black Point Command talks. Yeah. We're encouraging everyone to ask those difficult questions. Like, if, if, yeah. You know, we don't care if you ask us, we're going to be honest. And if we can't answer the question, we'll go away and we'll find out the answer. and We'll come back to you, whether you're a customer or not, we care. Right. Um, right. And I, I, you know, I think that's a big thing. And that's something the entire security community should emphasize is don't sweep things under the rug. Right. Don't hide things. Be open and transparent and answer yeah. those difficult questions. If you can't answer the difficult questions, just respond that you can't answer that right now and you'll come back to them. Because it's important that we're encouraging MSPs and customers of MSPs to ask those difficult questions. And yeah, there's no question. The ask your vendors yeah. what in the hell they're doing to ensure oh, yeah. their code base is secure. This is Absolutely. an issue. Like yeah. we, you know, oh, yeah. this is a one dirty secret. Like we probably shouldn't shouldn't air too heavily, but you know, send it. Um mm -hmm. we see a lot of tools out there that are used by IT professionals and they make us nervous. Mm -hmm. They straight up make us nervous. And I think it's incumbent as us as, as vendors to the IT and IT security community that we're doing the best we know how to secure our code base, mm. right? You know, because the, the exploit in the mm -hmm. you know, kind of security researcher work is only going to increase in the space. And, it's gonna, and, you know, it's one of these things we know right now in our SOCX, if you're an all on-prem style infrastructure, you are more likely to get ransomware. However, if you go all cloud, when it's good, you're less likely to be ransomware. When the cloud has an event, it's a house of cards. And I think that's oh, yeah. something that, uh, you know, the insurance industry is going to have to wrestle with massively. 
and mm -hmm. you know a lot of folks have to wrestle with is the fact that like the cloud is great we love the cloud it's more efficient enables business it's also heavily loaded weapon so you know if you're a business and you're making a cloud app you need to make sure the the infrastructure is fully is secured and monitored as possible for all the folks that can administer, apply updates to the cloud, push code releases, you name it, because that shit goes epically sideways. Um, and when you have an agent oh, that's yeah. calling back to the cloud and that agent mm. gets co-opted because the cloud can give it command and control, you know, for something malicious, I mean, you're, imagine the Kasey event. And I, I want to say, I think Kasey did, a, everyone likes to throw shade on vendors in this game. But I think Kasey in the heat of the battle did a great job in in that event last year we're heading up to the fourth of july really the anniversary of this event that friday before the fourth of july last year <laughs> oh you're you right the crap yeah. out of me when you called me because you don't call me with wow, any good wow. news anymore <laughs> it's only bad news. <laughs> and uh and i think they did a good job you know shutting down their cloud that fast was really useful yeah. they stayed pretty calm too like they didn't need your yeah or yeah and and yeah, they, they... you know listen we're not guys that build up a vendor you know, because we think we need to or tear them down because we think we need to. We're pragmatists at the core. Um, and I would say my pragmatic view on the situation is they did a good job in the heat of the moment. Uh, and it helped us. Yeah. And it helped our response. That's why we had zero customers mass ransomed in this. Yeah. You know, what else? Anything else, guys? Or it's time to wrap it on this that's Friday. I, I think I think that's everything from me. <laughs> that's yeah. all I have. Well, good stuff. Well, gents, much much appreciated good insight david that poc was cool yeah, it was good. good to see it yeah, you thanks, know, and live. yeah. right yeah, we'll try and, we'll in. try and do more of those every time we come across something interesting and cool i'd, I'd love to do some more of these demos on here um yeah yeah and i mean we're, we're doing it all the time internally so we might as exactly, well show exactly show right. yeah, right. responsibly <laughs> what we think is useful so exactly with that gents we'll wrap this sucker and thanks everyone for watching and more to come see ya See ya. Thanks See a lot. Ya.